Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I want to just take a quick moment to introduce our panel here this morning. We're going to be talking about reimagining the clinical trial process uh, from research, and can we move it from research-centric to collaboration-centric process? Um, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Byrne in the middle. Uh, Jennifer is the founder of The Greater Gift. Through The Greater Gift, over eight, 80,000 vaccines have been donated to children in need in developing countries in honor of clinical trial part participation. Each vaccine recognition expresses gratitude for the medical heroism of a trial volunteer or life science individual who is advancing health advancement locally to affect global impact one child at a time. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, Amy Price, to my right, is the director of the ThinkWell charity where she leads the public-led online trials infrastructure and tools project. Her institutional affiliation is with the University of Oxford, and her goal is to build clear channels to propel evidence into practice by supplying the public and those in low resource areas with tools to make evidence-based healthcare choices and responsible shared decision making. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. And on the far side of the couch, I'd like to introduce Marcella DeBita, Vice President of Patient Affairs at Science 37. Marcella is a molecular biologist focused on developing strategic collaborations with innovative clients that will enable the execution of more personalized clinical trials. Hmm. Welcome, Marcella. Thank you. All right. So Amy, Jennifer, it was just wonderful presentations we just had um, in the inaugural Jerry Matzak uh, panel, which I'm very grateful to have your voices um, and your perspective honoring Jerry's vision that he had for patient-centric clinical trials. So the first question I want to toss out to all of you really is, how might we shift our focus from the existing research models toward a more collaboration-centric one? Amy, would you like to start? Um, yes, I'd like to see um, participants involved in every aspect of the trial. And I love um, the initiative that Jennifer has started to immediately reward people for participation because the results of a trial can take years. Um, but when, the, when participation is awarded right away, it gives people dignity, it gives people autonomy, and um, the fact that they are giving back right away, that their life means something, and, and that's so important. So in, in practical ways, we can make a difference. Um, we can make it easier for people to sign up. We can take a lot of administrative hurdles out of the way. We can make uh, consent more uh, friendly in sense of delivering more knowledge without losing the, uh, the legal terms that are, are needed in terms of the trial. And um, we can make aftercare also uh, where people are followed up um, after the trial uh, so that they build a, a community, so a research community. So then it's something that if a friend or um, family uh, comes down with a condition that um, is not amenable to traditional care, they'll, they'll immediately think, why not? Why not sign up for a clinical trial? Because clinical trials save lives. Yes, they do. Jennifer, we'd like to uh, I would say that I think there's an opportunity for everyone to be drivers of the change. And what I would like to see is for everyone to be demanding of your healthcare professionals to bring you clinical research. Um, in addition, I think that for providers in the healthcare system to be demanding of their administrators to be supportive of clinical trial. Uh, activities and bringing the infrastructure and support. And then, you know, we can't forget, uh, we need pharmaceutical companies to be truly appreciative and grateful for the gift of clinical trial participation. And I think together then we can really drive real collaboration. Mm -hmm. Marcella, do you have any thoughts? I think that more than a thought, I have a wish, which is to include these stakeholders in this conversation next year here at MedX. I would like to see a panel powered by patient, 
and, pay, and patients and payers and regulators and pharma companies as well, because we need everyone sitting at this table um, together, um, seeing this and witnessing this and seeing the power of the story, story teller, telling that is unleashed here at MedEx, because after you see this, you cannot be the same person. And I think that this give, will give us the strength and the courage to make some decisions that are hard in this very highly regulated environment, but that we do need. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat> one, one more question, I guess, for all three of you. Um, and Jennifer, you touched on this, and Amy, you both actually touched us on this in your presentations. The idea of incremental change versus going out there and trying to hit the home run. It seems like the innovation in, in the, the mindset that we're in right now in clinical trials is we have to go for the big, the big slam dunk or the, you know, the big change out of the gate when, when we're really suggesting that if we step back and start to take incremental changes, that's where the momentum's going to come. Absolutely. What do you, how do you feel about that? What, what would you add to that? I think that that's the most healing way to, uh, to deliver clinical trials, and it's a redesign because, because clinical trials are, uh, there's been a lot of time and, uh, and effort and thought put into them as they are. So you don't need a big change. It's a small change, working with what we already have uh, to make a difference, using what, using what we already have every day. And if we use what, what we're, we're doing every day uh, in clinical trials and use, use that small portion to make small changes, eventually it'll make a, a large change. It'll change the culture. Whereas if we say, okay, we're not doing this anymore. Uh, we're going to throw it all out and everybody has to learn everything all over again. Um, it doesn't work. It alienates people. And what we want is to build bridges and not walls. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Well, Amy, you were reading my mind. I was just <laughs> thinking it, it, the key is building bridges and making this more relevant for everyone. I actually think that there's a huge opportunity. We talk about clinical trials, and then we talk about the other part of the healthcare system. And there is a, an opportunity for convergence, because again, in my experience, um, clinical trials actually can serve to be a great teacher to the healthcare system. Yeah. The level of organization that goes into the clinical trial and just the, the collaborative spirit that to bring forth uh, data with, with the highest integrity actually, I think, can be a, 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 a tremendous uh, resource to help healthcare become more efficient. Um, so again, that's, that gets to the shared value that, that I talked about before. Um, that it's not a, we have to choose one or, over the other, but how do we really bring them together as and? And how do we really take the small incremental changes along the way to integrate clinical research as part of the, just the continuum of care for the average everyday patient? not for the extraordinary patient under extraordinary circumstances who might just happen to fall into a trial. Mm -hmm. Great. My question um, to Jennifer is really um, trying to understand. So first of all, I'll start saying that I've been advocating for clinical research as a care of option probably since its inception. I think that Jennifer showed us today that there is evidence, and Larry actually started the session, um, the first day session, showing data in support of how clinical trials are providing a better care for people. So it almost becomes a moral obligation for us to bring those opportunities to people that are in need. My question to you is, how do you see clinical research as a care option fit in this new model of co-creations where patients are partner, partners in research? Well, I think it's just you know, very intentional about expanding the menu of options for empowered patients. 
And, and so if we use technology and if we are thinking about different economic models, perhaps uh, pharma is very much still in this fee-for-service. There's a rub with the healthcare system um, and other payment systems. So sometimes there are some, some friction points there. So I think that there are some root cause issues um, to, be, um, to be addressed. But again, I think that if we are looking at just syncing this up as, you know, not, not the answer for any given person at any given time, but at least it is something that we are moving towards out of respect for everybody's opportunity to be more involved in their own well-being. Thanks. Um, Amy, um, I was really intrigued by one of your recent publications titled Mind the Gap. And maybe you are going to share a few words about what the research is. But in particular, one sentence really caught my attention and resonated with me. And I'm going to read it because it was kind of too long for me to remember it. The sentence is, the first thing we need is a list of those things that make people feel powerless and a set of limited achievable objects to start removing the barriers to people taking control of the scientific process. My question to you is, how might we start collecting the list of those things that make people feel powerless? And in your research, did you get a sense of what are the achievable object objectives, the objects that we could start and should start focusing in? Um, yes, actually, um, the man that gave that quote was a mathematician and a physicist. And he later, during the publication, became a patient. Both of his legs were um, amputated um, because of a, a diabetes incident. Um, so he went, it, it almost became prophetic. Um, one of the, the way that we prevent people from feeling powerless is to include them. When we feel included or when we feel like something is home, um, that's where we feel we belong, where we have a, a, a place, where we have a, a, a geography. And I would like to see where patients feel home in a clinical trial, for the time that they're in the clinical trial, that, that they, feel, uh, they feel welcomed, um, they feel cared for, and uh, they feel that they can openly go for information. I would like to see in every trial that's possible that patients would have their own dashboard so they can watch their progress. And then later, that dashboard would be uh, amalgamated um, with what happened all through the trial. And that patients would know at the end of a trial whether the trial worked or whether it didn't. And what the patients really want to know, what are the future plans after the trial? What's next? If this trial failed, what's, what's going to happen next? And you know, sometimes that's not known, but to bring uh, participants into that discussion and say, this is why we know or this is why we don't know, it would be, uh, it would be huge and it would start to um, bring in power. And I say, you know, um, there are certain things that make us feel powerless. Ask us, ask, ask patients, ask participants. How could we increase your feelings of power? What kind of things make you feel powerless? Because sometimes it can make, be small things, like not making eye contact or saying, I can't tell you that right now, or, um, or turning, turning your back on someone. So sometimes it's not the huge things at all. Sometimes it's little things that we can do in everyday life that keep that conversation going so that we feel, uh, we feel like a family for the time that we're together. We feel like a, a team, and it, it is everyone included. Can I add of something to that? So I think another really important piece in thinking about the patient um, and the empowered patient through the clinical trial process, I think we need to be more intentional about being inclusive, not only of the research physician, but the patient's entire sphere of medical support and family support. And quite frankly, over the years, I've seen a lot of physicians get turned off to research 
not even think about wanting to advocate for trial participation because they had a patient in their practice that participated in somebody else's clinical trial. And they know nothing then about that clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as a clinician, there's no worse thing. That's a very vulnerable feeling when you take very seriously the care and well-being of your patient, and now this patient has gone off, and they're doing this experiment apart from you. So I think we have to be very intentional about being all-inclusive, ultimately, to put the patient in the very best position. Yeah, absolutely, and um, that's one of the things that came out in the research that oftentimes uh, when the physicians or healthcare workers uh, weren't informed, the health professionals, uh, the patients felt like uh, they were betraying uh, that trust, the trust, the trust of their provider, and it broke down uh, parts of the relationship in the patient's own mind. And it, it's like it, if you feel that you've betrayed someone, you don't really look them in the eye, and you and um, you don't connect the same way. So the next time that the the patient sees the the clinician, then the clinician sense, senses that there's there's something off, and that would be so easy to pre, to fix um, just by giving everyone the information and the clinician can give better health care by knowing what went on in the trial. Well, well I, I just, I'd like to add just from the patient perspective, um, I've had the same oncologist for over 20 years and we've talked about this before, what, whatever happened if I actually needed to seek care outside of the relationship that I've built with, with her already and, and her answer to me was very telling. It was, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure you're getting the best care. And, it, and in her mind, that meant if I have to send you to another institution or another academic medical center to get the care you need, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be the one that chases the information. And, and, and not enough oncologists and physicians, I think, approach it that way. So there is, you know, patients are working very, very hard to build these very critical relationships with their health care teams. And sometimes a clinical trial um, sort of, I don't want to say threatens, but it, it, it adds an element of, uh, you know, of uncertainty um, and sort of a risk in that relationship. And we've worked very hard to, you know, trust these doctors and work with these doctors. And, you know, sometimes it, it can be a scary proposition, but you're, when an oncologist comes back to you and says, we're going to do whatever it takes, that's, that's the kind of collaboration that, that you want to see from. I think I would find that so reassuring. Yeah, I do very much. So. Well, I think that it's also this industry responsibility to create solutions mm -hmm. that allow the care circle of the patients to stay involved while patients make a decision together with his or her physician to undertake the journey of a trial. And we know that there are solutions that are out there for physicians and caregivers to be included and partner with their loved ones and everyone who is actually making the trial possible. So it's happening. It's not as fast as we might hope for, but, um, you know, we are starting to hear this happening and, and it's good to bring it up. I, I, you know, I will say, though, um, it kind of within in my company while I was there, um, I look back and I think we could have done so much better um, on a particular issue related to this. So as a practical practice, patients would come in to participate in clinical trials and we would have them fill out a lot of paperwork and that would include HIPAA, you know, releases. Mm -hmm. And so we always were very proactive about, of course, we are going to provide any information that we can as long as you give us permission. And what I realized over the years, that was very passive. Because mm -hmm. when we looked at the data at one point, um, we actually saw that I think it was about 15, 16 percent of the patients, the patient volunteers, did not want us to notify their other physicians. And I feel badly about that now, but we were that passive because, it's, well, that's, that's really the patient's choice. And on further reflection, and, and we did adjust this as a business practice, we saw that it was really our responsibility to have a deeper conversation with a patient because there is that element of, I don't want to cheat on my 
on my doctor or my mm-hmm. caregiver. You know, I don't want to disappoint them because I actually still have some need that they haven't been able to fulfill. And so I think it is about taking it one more step from an education standpoint and for us to kind of debunk some of those myths or some thoughts that patients might have. Yeah, and sometimes patients patients also feel if the trial is going badly, um, they will um, hide their symptoms because they don't want to spoil the trial for um, the other people. So that kind of education between the, um, the clinician could actually almost be like a buffer, right. a trusted buffer um, in like in a strange environment and could encourage the, uh, in- encourage the patient to, uh, or the participant, both participant and patient, um, to open up. So yeah, I, I think pursuing that actively, it, it's like with organ donation, when, when they said, uh, when it was passive, um, there were fewer people that donated organs. But if, if you, in countries where they said, um, put the X right here and sign your name, if you don't want your organs donated, people were, uh, people were willing to go forward. So that if you're going to, we're going to give the information, if you don't want the information shared, um, then uh, let us know. That might, something like that might be effective even. Mm-hmm. Alicia, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so what needs to happen from a patient perspective in order for us to be able to incorporate the patient perspective in clinical research? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's twofold. It's f- make the information much more easily, uh, readily available, first of all, and easy to consume. Um, when I was first given an option for a clinical trial, when I was 19 years old, I was given a binder. Um, and they, my, the oncologist at the time gave me the binder and said, go home, read through this, and you have your appointment at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Let, let us know your decision. And we went home that night, and my mother sort of combed through the binder. And my mom, I just remember my mom at one point saying, I have two advanced degrees, and I can't make any sense of this. And she was so frustrated. And we went back to the doctor the next day and said, no. We're not going to partake in the trial because we couldn't understand it, and they couldn't give us they couldn't give us the decency of time to help us make a very critical decision. Um, so I think having the the care teams respect that this is this is a very serious decision in some cases. Um, this isn't simply a flip of a coin. Um, you need to be able to give the patient time to process what this decision that you're asking them to make. So be respectful of the time and energy that it takes to take in this information and actually think about making a decision. But, um, and sort of subsequent to that, I think you, we have to build a culture where this is not, clinical trial isn't an add-on. It's a component of your care that's given to you as an option. Clinical care as a research option means it's, there's more than one choice. You're, it's something that you need to talk about in a collaborative way with your oncologist or your physician, whatever disease state that you might be in, you know, seeking out a clinical trial. But it, we have to move that conversation much more forward in the, the patient journey. So out of the gate, when you're diagnosed with a new condition, the first thing that we should talk about is this is the current standard of care. These are the current clinical trials that are out there. And as a team, we're going to sift through it all and make a decision together. That's, that's where we have to get to. Patients are, want this information. Patients crave information when they're at a point of diagnosis or they're at a critical point in their journey. So we have to make sure we give them access in a way that works for them. So I think that that is where we really have to be intentional, well, intentional about technology mm-hmm. because there's an opportunity and right now the technology on the healthcare side and on the farm side, they're, they're disparate and great solutions out there. 
great pace, patient facing um, value solutions. But it's about linking that. And you know, I think that to make this happen, this probably goes back to the first question, from a practical standpoint, it's, be, it's thinking about you know, the technologies and the information that we have out there to bring the right trial to the right patient at the right time. And it's, it's a different form of precision medicine, mm -hmm. in, in a way, if you think of it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think also, you know, if we are hoping for physicians and treating physicians to be involved in that conversation, and we know that close to 80% of the people would participate in clinical research if this recommendation was coming from their treating physician, I think that there is an opportunity for us to think about what are the right incentives for physicians and how might we build the time for those physicians to actually have an understanding of the options that are available for the people they are treating. Because not every trial that is out there is good for people. Not every trial is good for everyone. And outside of the you know, incredibly helpful tool of trial matching that just decide if you fit those criteria or you don't fit those criteria, there is also like a different component that it's really a medical opinion of, I have known you for a long time. And this, I mean, based on this schedule of assessment, you know, you are taking care of your mom. I don't think you can participate in this trial. I think that, you know, when I, in my previous life at Harvard Clinical Research Institute, I actually had um, the access to many, many physicians. And so I would always survey them. How many patients did you refer in a trial this week? And how many patients did you refer? And they said, like, you know, the truth is that we don't. And when you ask why, it's because we don't have the time to understand and really fully grasp what each trial is offering. And if you make that recommendation, that becomes your responsibility. So I think that that is, you know, going back to we need to be uh, probably like considerate of also like these other stakeholders that should be included and what does it take or what would it take for them to be included in the right way. Mm -hmm. That's great. great. Okay. Well, I will, I'll, I'll save my time for the last question then. How's Perfect. that? Perfect. All right, Go great. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit today about the clinical research as a care option. And Amy, you've talked about how giving power back to the patients is one way to, you know, help facilitate these conversations. And I, and I see these two ideas being very closely linked together. I think this clinical care as a research option is a mechanism to give the power back to the patients in ways that we've never done before. I mean, if, if you were to sort of wind the clock out for, you know, next year's MedEx, where do you think we're going to be able to take this conversation? And what are some of these incremental wins that we can have between now and next year that, that begins to show us measurable progress toward this as a goal? What would we have to do to get there? Um, well, um, personally, I'm working on a, a capstone project for, uh, for interactive informed consent where, uh, where videos and things can be uh, can be put in so a, a clinician and a patient can work in a shared uh, decision-making way about a clinical trial. So that could also be done with um, a, a nurse practitioner, um, but where it where it, it gets everyone involved. So what the, and then I think if each one of us, um, you know, as individuals, if if we thought all of us know physicians or we are physicians. Uh, or participants, if, if each one of us raise the awareness of clinical trials and, uh, and getting involved and even help your friends or um, clinicians find a clinical trial, I think this one, you know, might fit this person. You know, one person helping one person um, uh, and that person helps another person, a, a, a lot can get done that way. So that's a, uh, those are like small uh, incremental changes that, that we can make. That's great. Jennifer? I would say for healthcare systems, large physician practices, to actually go in and start looking at your data. If you were involved in clinical research, the data that I talked about a little earlier, I'm convinced that data is there. And I think that you know it's, it's all about data and making those you know, data-driven decisions. The data, I think, will prove the relevance for clinical research. Great. 
Marcella, any last thoughts? Uh, no, I think I, I see we are at zero. On yeah, <laughs> I wanted to actually like give the opportunity for any questions if we still have time from the audience. Uh, all right. Yeah. Go. Yeah, I'm wondering what are your thoughts about the current sort of the cultural environment has shifted very much. The cultural environment these days has shifted toward this kind of anti-science um, facts don't matter, evidence doesn't matter, yeah, you can get the best scientists in the world in a room and tell us something and we're still going to say, yeah, but who cares? That environment, and that's, it's unfortunately quite prevalent, how do you navigate those waters and engage people in clinical trials and make science important and relevant and meaningful again? Uh, I think that if, when, you, um, when you get people informed, and you get them informed in an evidence-based way, you increase health literacy. And if you start um, with the participants and with the clinicians, and what you do is, is based on evidence, then the respect for that evidence grows as it's communicated. If evidence is an abstract con um, concept um, that is used as, uh, as a whip to say, you can't have this, or there's no evidence for this, then it becomes disrespected. But if you say, uh, if you share with people, this is what evidence can uh, can do for you. I think that the science and medicine needs to be uh, needs to be exalted and it needs to grow together because it's the hope for our future. So we are out of time. So I guess we're. Um, I'm going to suggest that if you do have questions, we're going to um, be right outside afterwards to take more questions, or you can tweet the question to the MedEx hashtag because we're actively monitoring that and you'll probably hear from me if you do that. <laughs> so um, thank you very much to the panel. I appreciate it. Great job. <laughs>